So I'm really pleased to have our two guests here, uh, Neeraj and Steve. Uh, congratulations on being selected Entrepreneur of the Year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I wanted you to give us a sense of um, how did you guys originally hook up? Like, you know, how did you meet when you were in college? Yeah. Uh, so we went to Cornell, we were 95, um, as Zach mentioned. Neeraj and I took an entrepreneurship class the last uh, semester at Cornell, which was uh, Professor Ben Daniel uh, was, a, was, a, was a professor of it. He was Entrepreneurship 300, or three, I forget what the exact number. Three, so we uh, so in those so days we it was 300. It was actually just walking through the lobby here. It was, it was very nostalgic, because I, you know, you I see there's a bunch of students have put together uh, business ideas. I, we did the exact same thing, and we got a little carried away with the research. Uh, we'd go down to Ithaca, New York, and basically pitch the businesses in town here to try to sell them what we thought, our idea, and by the time we graduated, we had a, a business going. So you guys have been partners since all the way back then? Yeah, like, so, how do you Like, how do you actually stand so, so each other like, all of these years? <laughs> <laughs> so we met each other the summer Bef the summer between junior and senior years of high school oh my at God. the six-week program at Cornell. Yeah. And then we coincidentally ended up three rooms apart on our freshman year floor in uh, Sperry, which doesn't exist anymore, but it was one of the U-Hauls on West Campus. And, and then we were friends for four years, and then we started a business together, and now this is, we're on our third business together, but we, yeah, we worked together for, uh, for, for 23 years. What makes a thing like that work for so long? I mean, how, do, how, does, that, how does that happen? <laughs> Uh, you know, um, it's an well, I, there's a few transitions. I mean, obviously, I think you have to be committed to the relationship, and you have to want to make it work. I think, you know, we both probably have a similar sense of what's fair. We both have similar work ethics. You know, I think we both have different skills. Um, and you work through a lot of things. You know, when you transition from being friends in college and hanging out at Ruloffs and drinking here in town together or whatever uh, to becoming business partners where kind of your financial livelihood uh, relies on the other one. You go through some periods where you learn how to argue, you learn how to, you know, give each other feedback. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I guess you figure out, you need to figure out early on whether you really believe and trust in the person you're working with. So I think that's a lot of it. I, you know, I think we were also fortunate in that, you know, we, you know, we both gravitated to kind of areas of the business that were very complementary to each other. So we didn't like want to do the same things as each other. We both found complementary areas very interesting. Um, and we kind of had you know, shared, shared views of what was exciting, what wasn't exciting. So that, that kind of from a you know, business strategy standpoint, that was always pretty easy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll tell you one thing, too. I tell our team a lot is that if you, if you think about your, your life and the, the, the people you spend your waking hours with, which I would consider to be your quality hours in your life, the people you work with are a huge percent of that time. And so, you know, I've spent more waking hours with Nirichir than any human in the world today, even my wife. Um, and we have three children, and we spend a lot of time together, but it, it dwarfs, you know, for the 26 whatever years we've spent time together. So you, when you get into business together, it is truly, you know, you have to think about it as okay, kind of a real okay, partnership. Yeah. <laughs> it's going a little too... Sorry. Um... <laughs> we need some counseling. <laughs> so um, I would like you guys to tell me what is Wayfair in your words. Like, describe what your business is all about. Sure. So, you know, th there's a few different ways to describe it, but, but basically, we're the leading online retailer focused on the home. So when you think about furniture, decor, the finished parts of home improvement, you know, plumbing fixtures, lighting fixtures, flooring and tile, door hardware, your backyard, your garage, we want to be the definitive source for that. We have the biggest selection, the best merchandising, the best delivery, the best logistics. And one of the ways we do that is we really, we believe that technology can make everything better. So we power everything with proprietary home-built software. And so we have 2,000 people in the company that do nothing but build that software, product managers, designers, 1,300 of them are software engineers. And the whole goal, everything we do is oriented around customers. So the customer, what's their ideal experience? How do we build that or how do we get closer to that? And constantly with that philosophy, working on every aspect, uh, whether it's selection or merchandising or delivery or customer service. And we do these things ourselves and we just have this kind of you know, kind of ambitious, really bright, talented group of people that are just all working on different aspects of that, and, and that, that's, what we're, that's what we're going for. So that's great, and I, give me a sense of your respect, because you said you're complimentary, and I'm curious about that, so what are your respective roles? Yeah, so, yeah, it's, um, 
Well, it's kind of funny because um, you know, we're obviously both, we were both engineering students at Cornell, and we started the business. Initially, the idea was, you know, I was going to focus more on the engineering aspect. Right, software. Steve, yeah. yeah, Steve was going to focus more on like kind of business, sales, marketing, those kinds of aspects. Um, I, I initially taught Steve how to program in Perl. Um, my programming skills then substantially declined in the days <laughs> after that. Um, but uh, basically, what the roles are today. So I've, I've been the CEO in that role for you know, more or less the whole time, and I, I gravitate towards like the general management type aspects of it. And Steve's sort of been sort of our visionary technology leader. And if you think about what I said earlier about how integral we think of technology in every aspect of it, it's really, it's, it's a very, you know, it's kind of like the fabric with which we do everything. So, um, you know, I think, uh, when I think back when we were younger, and I look out as a young bunch, you know, whatever, younger people in the crowd, the, uh, and these women in the first row were very well, young. Look at this was this is what I think at the time. My father was a stockbroker. His father worked for GE. So like he was good at engineering, and I was you know thought I was good at sales. It turns out we had it completely wrong. So I was much better at software side. He was much better kind of the sales relationship side. I like to think it was I'm good at software and sales. <laughs> yeah, I know you do. I like to think of it the same way. But I'm glad I don't do what you do. What were you saying? Did you have a point? <laughs> I'm glad I have a mic and you're not handing it to me. So say a little bit about the kind of the early stages of the business. And, and you know, you guys had, it was, it was interesting because it was really a small, niche kind of businesses that you sewed together. T talk a little bit about how that, yeah, how that happened. Well, yeah, so we, we started Wayfair in 2002. And in 2002, it was right after the dot-com crash. So most folks in the room are probably not old enough to remember this. but Basically, in 2000, you know, 98 through 2000, there's like this vertical climb where the internet was going to take over everything, the stock market went crazy, and, and that was then, you know, followed by this crash. And at, right after that crash, 2001, 2002, there was sort of a, the the natural sort of recoil to that. So no one was interested in e-commerce. It was viewed as kind of down and out and dead. And we were, we had sold our first business, and we'd focused on a software business that didn't really go anywhere. So we were looking for a new idea, and we basically we ended up coming across a set of data uh, that basically implied that e-commerce was growing at 20-something percent a year. Consumers really enjoyed buying things online, but in fact, you know, the conventional wisdom, what was being printed in newspapers, was just a reaction to more of the stock market or, you know, you know kind of psychology. So we ended up, our idea was we'll just launch a series of websites that are focused on niche categories that are underserved. And so the first one we launched, we launched a website called Racks and Stands, selling TV stands and speaker stands. And we wanted to have the biggest selection, the most organized site with the best service. But there was no brand. We just figured out how to use online advertising to find people who were searching for these categories, drive them you know, to the site. And what happened is you know, from that, we, a lot of our suppliers were saying, well, a lot, of my, a lot of my customers, a lot of the retailers sell more of my desks than my TV stands. Or a lot of my retailers sell more of my beds than my TV stands. And in four months, we grew to be their biggest online retailer in entertainment furniture. So then we moved into beds, and we launched a website for beds called bedroomfurnituredirect.com, and then we launched a site for office furniture, and so on and so forth. Take us through all 250. All right, <laughs> all right so in order, no. Um, but so long story short, you know, we kind of did that for years. We ended up with 250 of these things. Um, but we, they were basically mainly in home, in furniture, and then in decor, and then in, in home improvement, and housewares. And so a decade later, you know, is when we decided that we wanted to build a brand, and that's when we built Wayfair and we consolidated them underneath it. So it was initially just the two of you, is that right? Yeah. In, the, in, ter in terms yeah. of starting yeah, it's my the house business. In Boston, a little desk. So you know, I've always heard that um, there are different skills associated with being founder, and then in running a larger, <laughs> larger corporation. I'm curious about how you feel you've evolved in that process. I mean, because many don't actually make that transition. Yeah. And often, yeah. you know, you there's like a big management shakeup yeah. and change, et cetera. But well, you know, I'm curious I, what I you think know, say In the early days, that. right, you have, to, you have to sort of do everything yourself. So you have to be, you know, willing to kind of flexibly shift between things. And you have to be reasonably good at doing each of these things. So you have to know all the details. And, be, and then as you scale, somewhere along the way, you have to accept that you're not going to be able to know everything yourself. And it becomes much more about, you know, the caliber of the people you hire, the clarity of the communication and the plans, the, you know, ability to kind of use higher level pattern recognition to kind of tell if things are working, not working. As the company gets bigger and bigger, you increasingly move to that mode. 
and your ability to personally make sure anything goes well becomes very low. Well, and too much. how you got there, I think, we, this is the third company we started, and the first company was this company, it was a professional service company, we started right out of Cornell. It, it was a company that got big, it got to 40 people, we sold it to a larger company, it became a thousand person company, went public, Neerge was the CEO of the whole thing, I ran a, a, a team in London, and we kind of grit our teeth on that. And, and I would say, you know, learned a lot on, you know, through that experience of how to sort of, well, you were forced to go through this mega scale. Well, we period. learned a lot. Basically, you know, so you know the funny thing: you, when things go well, you don't learn anything. You learn a lot when things go poorly, right? That's like that's that's the story of life. Yeah. And in that business, we just there was like we had problems left and right. And I think, and that was a good. If you was, hadn't done that, you, it would have been harder to scale with this business as it scaled up well, and had that awareness. I think. So you built skills that sort of transcended all of those different. Uh, different yeah. Well, I think you know the other thing when I t we think about that particular problem domain space, I think Nirj and I are. We both are thoughtfully critical of each other, and this is one of the things you, you both are well aware of, that you can, you can fail as a company if you don't have the right leadership, you don't have people in the right role. And so as we've grown, I think we've been very thoughtful about challenging each other, say, hey, are you still the right person for this role? You know, should we try to find someone who's better at you than that? I, mean, I used to be the CTO at Wayfair, I'm no longer the CTO. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a great example of like, it went be way, you know, running a 1500 person engineering group is way beyond kind of what my core skill is. Um, and you know you have to be thoughtful about that as, as founders and I don't know having two of us probably helped that navigate that so you, you commented about the, the sort of the size of the uh, of the company um, there's some interesting you know just reading online uh, you have some interesting thoughts around culture and I'm curious if you could say a little bit about um, what is the culture of Wayfair who are you looking for and, and that fits into that culture yeah, sure. So, you know, the so the way we think about culture is the culture is really a manifestation of the people you have. So a lot of the mm -hmm. way you define the culture is like who are the people we want to have in the company because they will then attract more people like themselves. And well, so what do you need to succeed? Well, one is you want to you you know as a company we we're entirely oriented around customers. If customers have good outcomes, we'll succeed. So you definitely want people who are going to be very customer oriented and. The traits we think, if you're customer oriented, the traits we think you need to succeed are you need to be very bright, you need to be very analytic and quantitative, you need to be very ambitious, you need to be very collaborative. Most things we do in the company are very cross-functional. Um, and you need to have an appreciation for how to use technology as part of that solution. And so then if you have folks who have those traits and they're very customer oriented, right, uh, and then if you as a leadership team in the company can just turn them loose and let them go after the area that they're driving, you get really good outcomes. And, and then you know, people obviously, they wanna work with people who they can learn from, who they have fun with. You know? And so by, when you have people who have those attributes and they, they honestly enjoy what they're doing and they enjoy who they're working with, it cycles up. And so that, that's what we've always tried to preserve is Basically, let's make sure that everything I just said is true and make sure the new people we bring in represent that. Well, that's what I was going to say. I mean, so the, the other thing that sustains that is really important is that your hiring, in some sense, has to kind of continue to build. Your that. hiring yeah. has to, and you'll never be perfect in your hiring decisions. Right. And you also so have to do a good job of, of, of <clears throat> out-counseling those people who you hired who you thought were that and that turned out not to be. Yeah, it's, it's something we think about, you know, when we were five people, 50 people, 500 people, 5,000 people, we, we think about a lot along the way. And you're definitely building up, you know, as you bring in new people, the culture is very used to having a very high percent of the, the team at any given time be new. And you're always trying to make sure you have a core bench of people who are sort of the cheerleaders or the, you know, the, the ones driving culture and being thoughtful about it. And, and you, you know, you trust them, you believe in them, and then you're making sure that, you know, when you find pockets where you've, we've let the culture slip, you, you fix it. It's one of the things you know, I believe is being founder led to this point, we have a real advantage in that you know, we both care a lot about it. And so from the very top down, you have um, kind of good culture being set. So um, a little bit of a shift here. I'm curious about, you know, you've mentioned a few times uh, you know, that you're, you're, you're sort of data driven and yeah. data analytics and so forth. And I'm curious about, um, you know, what do you guys do and how do you do it? You know, what are the ways in which you're, you're trying to stay at the forefront? So, you know, so we do a, a variety of things, right? So at a very basic level, we collect tremendous amounts of data, and then we basically try to make it available to everyone in the company. So all the, the data, as much as possible, we make accessible through all these different cubes that it's not partitioned where only certain people have access to certain data. Everyone in the company has access to all of the data. 
And that right there, like, you know, some people call it democratization of the data, whatever you want to call it, basically it empowers people who then have the capability to use the data to answer any question they have. They can go after it, the data's available to them, it's easy to access, easy to understand how to find it. So that, that's have, one level. Do you have your own platform for that analysis? Is that a... Uh, so a lot of our data core databases are Microsoft SQL Server, and the cubes he's talking about are actually uh, SQL Server analytics services cubes that sit on top of that. Um, we run a lot of different analytic services today, and we run a lot of our own. Um, it, the underlying data storage stuff is not stuff we've developed, so we use Hadoop and, you know, um, we use a bunch of NoSQL different storage systems. But ultimately, we try to bake it up into tools that someone with some data sense can use. So a lot of the stuff is accessed through Microsoft Excel, and you, have, you can get very powerful access to, you know, data. You can give it to your team, and they can understand it very quickly. So we've tried to keep the tools simple. We used to, in the early years, have the philosophy of just teach everyone you hire SQL, because it's a great, it's a great language for getting at data, and you can get tools that kind of try to abstract that away, but they have their own complexities, and so we used to just, we always have just taken a, like, show people how to access it the way that, you know, someone who's a professional in trade would know, and that, that's worked quite well. And then we, we built some visualization tools on top of it, like Warp, and then on top of that, we then have teams that use data at a higher level, which requires you to be much more sophisticated. But, you know, when you start talking about some of the machine learning algorithms, you're talking about, like, very large-scale data analysis, then there's, we basically, that's a competency that we built large teams around as well. So we tried to basically take advantage of data at every level. What's, what's kind of the latest? Like, what's, is there, are there, are there new things under development that you can share? <laughs> we do have this one secret room. That we literally, he, he's actually telling like, the truth. Yeah, literally, that we we've signed all these. Now that he said it, he can't tell you what's in like, it. That's we can't talk about it. And it's under video surveillance. It's crazy what they made us jump through. But anyway, um, we've done some. We've done. Some, we're pretty excited about the augmented reality and virtual reality space. Mm. Um, we, we've moved to where, instead of doing photography in, in a photo studio and setting up kind of fake room scenes with carpenters, um, we do it 100% computer generated. So we have, you know, very good CAD artists that model all the stuff in CAD, and, um, and we use digital rendering to render out photography. We then have this massive, we think we have the largest model of, of furniture in the world today, a 3D model library of furniture. It's actually, we have a public API if anyone's interested in getting access to it. Um, you can find information about it. But uh, there's some really neat features that we're developing to let people visualize products in their home. And all the new phones, both Android and Apple, we've been very early um, kind of you know, beta teams at working with them to, to, to figure out how to help customers visualize products in their home. Um, so that's, I don't know, that's been some of the kind of fun stuff we've been doing recently. We have a lot of other like, cool technology, that, but it's underlying like, you know, dealing with transportation routing and, and sort of mm. some of that stuff that's not as sexy, but yeah. it's like it'll, it'll change the experience for customers probably more dramatically. And Steve, you and I talked about it in sort of a, in a separate conversation, but you know that you were you work with um, the suppliers, right? You actually you actually provide platforms to help them to so yeah, they can we, do their job well enough to make you look you know the way you want, and so so to speak. Right? Yeah, so no, it's a neat industry in that there's we have ten thousand suppliers we buy from, and they're all entrepreneurs too, and you know they're very good at product design, sourcing, figuring out what kind of needs in market. And so a lot of our business is trying to figure out how do you help make them successful. And so we've increasingly uh, gone into the business of providing software into that industry to help make all these other entrepreneurs successful, um, which we think creates you know, it's a great motivation on, on all sides. Sort of build a community. Yeah. Um, so you're back, and, you know, and, and you've uh, seen what's going on at Cornell. I'm curious about, do you guys reflect on what it is that we did right <laughs> <laughs> what did we get, what did we get right and what did we not get right but what did we get right I mean so what do you think about in terms of your education and how that fed into you know the, your ability to have founded three different uh, successful companies the, the two things that occurred to me like so one was you know I really feel like the undergraduate engineering education is a good foundational one in problem solving and things like that. So I think that's been very helpful mm -hmm. to me. The second specific to Cornell is, which today is far greater at Cornell than it was when we were here, was actually taking the one undergraduate business course we took, which was the only one available at the time, ended up being very formative because without that, I was based on a trajectory to go to graduate school and law school. C was on a trajectory to join um, uh, his family's uh, family business. And basically, you know, there would have been no catalyst for us to enter kind of an entrepreneurial career at that juncture. It was a process of creating this business plan and researching it that sort of 
we fell then into starting our first business. And that was really great because starting a business young is, is, is much easier. You know, mm -hmm. you, have, you have much less to lose and you, you don't have, you know, much in the way of obligations on current income and, you know, so on and so forth. And so it was really, it worked out incredibly well. And so at the time, I don't know how many colleges actually had an undergraduate entrepreneurship yeah, course. I would guess not very many. So Cornell was leading then, it's leading now. Today, obviously, the resource base for entrepreneurship is far greater, but I think that's, fa that's very fantastic. You know, I've always thought it's funny. So back in the 90s, there were probably a computer science scientist somewhere in the Cornell faculty that wrote the algorithm that decided who went to which dorm. So that person <laughs> has had more influence on my life than they know. <laughs> So that's what you hold up as I the don't pinnacle. Know. They did yeah. that right. No, you know, I, I love the fact that this campus was a place you could wander around, you could trip across all kinds of different skills, and you could get exposed to a huge variety of sort of thinking and, and you know, different areas of expertise. And I, 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 I love taking advantage of that when I was here. Yeah, I wonder, can I pick up on that? I mean, I don't know all of your living arrangements, et cetera, but, you know, many will say to me it was nice having the variety of people that we have here. Yeah. I mean, that sort of yeah, really sure. wide range of, of uh, in terms of just your peers and maybe just sitting around, you know, is that, is that ring true in your, in your uh, view? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I look at the roommates we had and the friends we had while we were here and, and you know, the influence of just, I think what it gave us is a comfort to say like, oh, I could try that. And like, yeah, that like, I know a person who does that and that's not rocket science. Like I could go do that. And so, as an entrepreneur, you, you're kind of a jack of all trades, and having that exposure to it I, was certainly. Yeah, and I think it's the benefit of being in, in a large environment yeah. where you know you have certain traits that are consistent across folks. You have really bright, talented, capable people, but then it's very heterogeneous when you start thinking about people's particular areas of interest academically or particular areas of interest in terms of activities. And because it's large, you know, you can find activities you're interested in. There's a there's a group of people that are really interested in that, and you can get to know them and so on. Yeah. So, I, so that what, was were fantastic. Your, what were your major activities, like outside of just <laughs> unending yeah. study? Things we could talk about? You, wait, you uh, could talk about it in a, you know, with a, with a, few, a few hundred of our, of your close I, friends. I do, I do have a story we're going to tell later tonight about Steve and how keg stands have played a very material role in his life. But, um, but what I would say, save that for, for me, you know, one thing I did, which was I enjoyed, was the Cornell, the, the concert commission. And just, you know, that was fun college student, there's a group of folks who are just producing concerts, and it was fun, and it was a group of folks, I knew some of them before, there's some I wouldn't have met otherwise. It was just fun, it had nothing to do with engineering. Yeah, I did yeah. the hybrid electric vehicle, uh, I don't know, it challenge, I, don't, I forget what you call them, but that was, that was amazing, it was a great fun team, you got to actually engineer something that you took on the road and like did a little tour with. Um, yeah, you know, your roommate Earl was also very influential. He was a kid who worked at the chem lab as, you know, he was working his way through school. My freshman year roommate. And I used to, we used to hang out there a lot up at the chem lab. And I remember just, you know, we'd, he'd come across stuff they were throwing out and we'd bring it back to our dorm and experiment with it. And, I don't know. Things that they're throwing out in the chem lab, I'm kind <laughs> yeah, of curious like, about. <laughs> I know, it sounds terrible, doesn't it? <laughs> it, was all, it was all safe. But. Safety considerations. Yeah, no, it was around. all safe stuff. <laughs> So now, uh, on the flip side, um, you know, say you were talking to someone like, you know, I don't know, say the dean of engineering, um, what, would you, <laughs> what would you suggest that, to that person in terms of making the place even better? I think the focus that you've brought in on entrepreneurship would have been, like, when I graduated, I remember thinking, that's the one thing I would change. That, you know, when we went to school, it was very much the mindset of, like, we're teeing you up to go work in industry for someone. And I think that change of mindset, so it's open students' mind to say, oh, actually, you can, you know, do your own thing, and you can actually, that's a viable career path. That, it's been shocking to see, you know, just in the last number of years here, how that, you guys are really focused on that. I think continue that is, I would think, is helpful. Would you? I think that's great, and then I also think, I mean, th these aren't really suggestions, because you're already doing both of these things, uh, but the other thing was just, the more you kind of get exposed to broader interdisciplinary things that are foundational. So you know, earlier today we were learning a little bit about what's happening with data science or you know programming and how these things are not necessarily just a narrow thing. You either do it or you don't do it. But it's you could be doing other things, but you have an experience base with it, even if it's modest. I think those things really matter because when I think about you know, how the nature of jobs is changing, a lot of those things are becoming very foundational. Where it's just, you know, when we went to school, you know, we, 
at Cornell you take two freshman writing seminars, which maybe you still take, and the whole notion was that the ability to write well is a foundational skill everyone needs. So regardless of your major, you should take these two freshman writing seminars. Well, you know, I think that probably makes sense, but as the world continues to change, understanding how to use data and how to think about its role or how to, you know, understand the notions of how computer programming just works and just the, that kind of logic-based thinking. I think these things are great. And so I think the more people are supposed to that, regardless of what their main area of study is, I think it's very helpful. Well, it's funny you say that, because that's really, I mean, there's a major initiative on the campus, the notion that that exposure really should be in the hands of everybody and not just, you know, sort of just yeah. the technically trained, yeah. those that are in engineering, um, is something that we're working on. You know, that's something that we really want like to see I feel like they made the technically trained guys learn how to write for a long time. Yeah, really. It's time to return that. With, very limited, yeah, exactly. with, limited, with limited success. With limited success, but, you know. Yes, we, we heard about that a little bit earlier. Um, so, I'm, you know, I'm wondering about, uh, you know, this audience uh, is really full of people you know, kind of at the stage you were at when you were graduating that have your aspirations. And so, you know, um, I'm wondering if you have words of wisdom to share with them. You know, what I always say is, you know, if you, if you have, you, you, should, you should only pursue ideas you're really very passionate and excited about. If you pursue something just because you think it's a good business idea, but you're not personally very passionate about it, I think it probably isn't gonna work because m most of the time, even if something will succeed, it's not a nice straight line. And so the way you get through like the really tough patches and the rocky patches are because you really enjoy it, you believe in it, you're very passionate about it, so it keeps you going on the tougher parts. The tougher parts are the parts that, are, that really matter more. Um, and then the second thing is, you know, I, th I think the reality, I said this earlier, but you know, I think you learn a lot more when things don't work than when they do work. So if you have something you believe in, and you think, well, I don't know if I can make it work or not, but if you're in a position to take the risk, I think often it's a great opportunity because either it will work, right, or it won't work. And if it doesn't work, odds are you'll learn a lot and that experience will be invaluable. Now, sure, get advice and, you know, if it's a terrible idea and everyone's basically explained to you logically why it's a terrible idea, then you probably shouldn't pursue it. But, you know, within, within the confines, I think there's a lot of gains to be had pursuing things and it's usually easier when you're younger than when you're older. Steve, I'm going to, I know yeah. you're no, probably going to weigh in, but, let, but I'm just going to yeah, hold, because I want to really pick up on this point about, you've said it a couple of times, and it's something that has so impressed me in um, where I sort of first encountered it as, as I started spending more time in the West Coast, honestly. It was when I was in sort of the Silicon Valley area. Where that is I, that? Yeah, it's a little, <laughs> it's a little you know, uh, suburban, suburban area in I the see. West Coast. Yeah. Um, but there, there's this, you know, this whole notion of failing and, you know, when things yeah. don't work, you learn more and so forth, which I, I, th I just think it's, a, it's just a fantastic, fantastic ethos that, for the most part, you know, it's almost like you have to untrain the way you've been trained the, your whole life, mm -hmm. because everything about life is about perfection and, you know, never making a mistake, and, you know, right, right. and then all of a sudden, you, you know, you're saying, no, no, actually mistakes are really, can really be the, where you learn the most. Yep. And I, I mean, I know that in the context of what I do as a faculty member, if I'm doing research, you know, that kind of thing. That's, you know, I always say that's the failing experiment that teaches you the most. But, um, but I've never heard it in this, in this way, and I've always really admired this and kind of wish there were a way of, you know, sort of expanding that beyond just entrepreneurship, because I think it's true in almost everything we do. Well, I think it's true in everything. I mean, it is true in everything. <coughs> you, you know, it's like... Um, did you learn more from when you hired someone and they worked out great or from when you hired someone and they didn't work out great and you remember exactly why they didn't work out great and it right. taught you a really key lesson, right? And yeah. So it's true in like everything. I mean, yeah. it's true, I'm sure, we, you know, I think it's true. You, you, and you know, I, um, so every Monday I do the new hire orientation at Wayfair and it's, you know, it's a group of 40, 50 people that are joining us every Monday. And I, I tell them a little bit about kind of the company and, you know, the, we have this formal orientation now and, and you know, it used to be your first day of work, you show up, there's four phones on your desk. We'd be like, all right, one of those is going to ring. If it's number three, answer it and say, this is Steve. Thanks for calling Mount Samore. How can I help you? And you'd do it, and you'd start taking calls. And Neeraj and I are sitting right behind you. And you'd get off the phone, and we'd probably turn and be like, oh, man, you didn't want to tell him that. Because that's going to come back to haunt you very quickly, <laughs> right? And, and so you'd create this culture where you, you would sort of celebrate failure, and you'd make it very much in the open so that people would hear it. And they got very comfortable giving feedback to each other. 
And then just, it's a norm, right? It's just like, okay, that's why you have it set up in an option, right? We're gonna talk about what's going wrong, we're gonna fix that. And it lets you iterate so much faster that you can get to much better outcomes. Um, and you know, that's, where you, that's where you learn, that's where you create a learning environment in a, you know, in a corporation. Were there any things that, you know, as you started down the, this path that you wish you knew? Or, you know, just a pearl of wisdom that, you, God, I wish someone had told me that. I could have saved myself all of this heartache. Um, any, any thoughts about that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think you yeah, learn, right. you learn things with right. hindsight, right? Yeah. So, you know, I, I think it took us years of experience to learn. I think today we've gotten quite good at, at, at knowing how to hire, knowing the traits we care about. But we learn that through iteration over time. Mm -hmm. And ideally, you would say it would have taken me half as long to learn that or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Wayfair brand has been really successful. We launched that six years ago. With hindsight, we think we could have launched it a year or two earlier. We mm -hmm. think we were ready, right? But, you know hindsight's not mm. a really fair mm. lens to evaluate mm. things with because, uh, you know, most things would be better with hindsight, you know? But even out of the shoot, maybe, did, were there things that uh, you took, you know, you sort of, in retrospect, think, boy, we should have known better than to, you know, I'm thinking about our young audience here. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I mean, if you, you know, advice for young entrepreneurs, it, it, hire smart people and be just rigorous around, you know, um, creating a culture where you can give them good feedback. And you know, if you if you do that, it'll probably work out yeah. very well. If if you get and and you know, the beauty of bootstrapping too, I think, is when you hire people and it's your own money and you're not getting paid, but you're paying your team, the incentive to do that is very very high, and so you sort of force yourself to naturally. Um, but it's something you should be doing regardless of the financial situation of how you've gotten into a particular entrepreneurial track that you're on. Um, if you can do that, it usually you know, good teams end up with good results. And they need to be able to have a culture that can be critical of themselves in a constructive way. And the only, the other, one other thing I'd say is I think you should trust your gut because, like, you know, you just sort of, there's a lot of times where you sort of like, you, you kind of know, but it's like, it's an uncomfortable thing. So you don't want to deal with it. So you like ignore it and you kind of kick, kick the can down the road. Those things are, they never get better. They never get better, you know? And so the, Trust your gut, you know. In terms of if there's an issue, yeah, and, and you, act you need on to it. face yeah. on it, yeah. face it, yeah. Her nerds will be coming around telling you, told you so later. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I, I, only if I told you. <laughs> so do you guys uh, think about, um, you know, what, what's next? Like, you know, you've had amazing success. Um, is it something you say we're, you know, we're going to continue to do this, or do you do you, do you ever have you know uh, thoughts about the next new thing that yeah. you'd like to get yeah. started? And no, I you know I I do so the, the thing about this business, what I mentioned earlier, you know, you should do something that's fun. Well, this business is I think a ton of fun. We still have a ton of fun. We have a great team that's fun to work with. And then the opportunity, despite the fact that we've had some good success, we've grown to be decent sized. We're we're a six billion dollar company. You know, five six billion run rate growing at around 40%. And the reason that's possible is our end market is minimum 600 billion in North America and Europe, probably more like a trillion if you add some of the markets that aren't in the clean 600 billion. So at 6 billion, with the amount of change the internet is having, it's still super early days. Yeah. And we, we maybe have 1% or less than 1% market share. So, you know, to me, this is, I, I don't think about doing something else. I see. Yeah, I, I'm all in. I mean, I, um, are, I'm very much, I guess, uh, thinking about that question, as a kid, I used to idolize like Richard Branson, Bill Gates, Michael Dell, Sam Walton. I love these, you know, great entrepreneur stories. And if you think about them, they're people that just, they, you know, they get on the thread of, of you know, a business that works and they just keep going at it. And I just love that concept from where we sit today mm -hmm. that like we have the potential to turn this into a great, you know, nationally, whatever, internationally known brand and it's you're not going to go do it again uh, you know or easily or you might as well exploit the opportunity you have in front of you so it's exciting so what do you guys do for fun it's been a, it sounds like a lot of hard work <laughs> is what i've been hearing but well new York's broke his clavicle this year skiing i enjoy skiing i don't enjoy breaking my clavicle but i enjoy skiing i enjoy playing tennis uh Conines and us all have kids around the same age. So my wife and I have a 11 and 13 year olds and hanging out with them is fun. We enjoy traveling. Um, I, I 
enjoy reading, although my attention span has dropped over the years. Um, those are some of the things. Yeah, I'm not bike a lot. I love being outdoors. We, we, we ski a lot. Uh, I took up playing guitar at 40, which has been a nice creative outlet as well. So I, I do that almost every night. It sounds great. Yeah. So um, just any final, final words uh, for our audience in terms of either advice or thoughts or? I'm really excited to see some of the, some of the, uh, the projects that the teams are presenting today, personally. And I mean, when you, if you're getting into a business, you know, small, I would encourage you to be excited about the small wins along the way. You know, at some point, you, I mean, obviously, we're a big company today, but, you know, we used to think that a $100 day was like a big day. And, you know, your $100 days turn into $1,000 days, turn into $10,000 days, turn into $1 million days. And it takes a long time, but, like, celebrate the small stuff along the way. Uh, you want it? Yeah. No, I mean, I think you make sure you're always pursuing things that you enjoy, whether it's a company you choose to join or a type of role you pick or starting something. I think that's key. Um, and next Wednesday's Way Day, lowest prices <laughs> of the year at Wayfair. You want furniture, um, shop that day. You know. All right. I, I don't know. Well, that's listen, on that note, I'd like to please join me in thanking our guests. This is a production of DMIG, the Dyson Media Innovation Group.